Many of you know, my dad passed away last week on Wednesday, May 3rd. I wanted to thank everyone for their prayers and kind comments. I read all the comments and many of my brothers and sisters are grieving for a lost loved one as well. I pray God brings you peace and comfort just as he brought me. As I am grieving the loss of my dad, God reminded me that if our loved ones are saved, we don't sorrow as others who have no hope and will see them again. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14 But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Also, I believe I will be seeing my dad and my mom very soon when the rapture occurs. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15-18 For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive remain until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. God bless you guys, the Watchmen. Welcome to the Watchmen channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. We are two and a half weeks out from the anniversary of the Uvalde school shooting, a week and a half after a neighbor opened fire in Cleveland, Texas, killing five people. And the breaking news that we're following overnight, another mass shooting in Texas, this one at a mall near Dallas. Gunfire ringing out as hundreds of shoppers on a Saturday filled the outlet mall in the suburb of Allen, Texas. Panicked people, as you can imagine, seen running from the scene as bullets flew. Just unbelievable pictures there. And police say the gunman was killed by a local police officer who happened to be in the area on an unrelated call. And this morning, authorities say eight other people were killed and seven wounded before that officer stepped in. And Janae, you were talking about those previous mass shootings. Listen to this. According to the Gun Violence Archive, this is the 199th mass shooting in the U.S. just this year so far. Let's go now to ABC's John Quinones in Allen, Texas. It is another sad and heartbreaking day, Wit, this time in Allen, Texas, just north of Dallas. The victims, innocent folks who are out enjoying a beautiful spring day, out shopping in the sprawling mall behind me. Overnight, FBI and local law enforcement officials searching the home of a Texas mall shooting suspect. His rampage allegedly left at least eight victims dead and several others wounded. <laughs> Multiple FBI agents were inside the suspect's home in Dallas talking to his family. We got shots fired at the other. Investigators reviewing this graphic video of the moment the gunman stepped out of a sedan and opened fire at the Allen Premium Outlets. Thousands of shoppers now running for their lives. There's this guy dressed in all black, wearing a vest, has an assault rifle, and he's just shooting at people. This surveillance video capturing a store employee leading customers to a service corridor to shelter. Quatina Ely sheltered in the fitting room. She says the gunman opened fire at her parents. They began to run and they both fell to the ground. Maybe he thought that he had shot them, so he turned the gun and began shooting in the other direction where there were a lot of people. These two employees at the mall describe the terrifying moments. And I hid behind a freezer and we, everybody thought that we were doomed. A police officer nearby heard the gunfire and shot the gunman dead. The shooter is now. We believe at this point that the shooter acted alone. I need somebody to take command on the south side of this outlet mall. We've got thousands of people down there now. Officers securing the crime scene, evacuating the shoppers from the mall, all walking out with their hands up. 
In addition to the eight victims killed, seven are in the hospital this morning. Three critical, four stable. The victims ranging in age from five to 61 years old. This community is home for us and our hearts are, um, are, are devastated and, and broken. I saw people running from the mall and I'm like, well, this ain't good. Steven Spainhauer raced to the scene after receiving a call from his son who was working at one of the stores. I started counting bodies. I counted seven. Spainhauer said he arrived before police got to the mall and started looking for survivors. A little boy was just soaked with blood uh, from head to toe, crawled out from under one of the victims and started walking around saying my mama's hurt over and over and over. So I grabbed him and put him around the corner so he could get him out of the uh, area of trauma. You went across three people who were dead. Yes. Until you found somebody who was alive. Yes. Did you find out anything about that little boy? I still don't know what happened to him. I would like to think he is okay, but I, it was, it was a little tough. The Army veteran says this scene was horrific. It was a war zone there. There's no way these people could have survived the assault of those weapons. I don't know how many times we have to tell this story. I think we all need to stop saying it could never happen here. I think oh, you're I, really, I'm surprised yeah. people still do. I, I feel the psychic weight of it possibly happening just about everywhere in yeah. this country. Yeah, and speaking of that no way, one is immune. I don't want to perpetuate this feeling that's settling in the souls of this nation, but this is another place that we add to the list that you, you might be afraid to go to, along with movie theaters and churches and malls and schools, hospitals. college campuses, hospitals. Churches. Yeah, but we can't get desensitized to it. We can't. We, can't. we have to keep talking about it. We have yeah. to keep Until talking about it. Until change happens. Yeah. And that's the question. What will it take for change? That is a question I ask all the time. The outlet mall near Dallas. We start hearing, rock, rock, rock. The Atlanta Medical Office. All I see was police cars and SWAT and everybody's just pulling up, pulling up, pulling up, back to back, back to back. Neighbors shot in Cleveland, Texas. A Sweet 16 birthday party in Alabama. A Louisville bank and an elementary school in Nashville. How are our children still dying and why are we failing them? The Gun Violence Archive counts more mass shootings so far this year than days, 199. That includes any shooting with at least four victims, not including a shooter. I've been studying this for 40 years and I've never seen a year like this. Criminology why professor James Fox oversees a database at Northeastern so University that keeps track of deadly mass shootings. Why are we seeing so many mass killings this year? We need to answer the question, why do mass shootings keep happening in America? What does this meaningless violence mean? Will it get worse and worse as the time of Christ's return draws near? If we think that things are going to get better and that mankind will solve this problem for less violence, we are fooling ourselves. The Bible indicates otherwise. The simple answer to why do mass shootings keep happening in America is God is being expelled from the essence of American society. Through Supreme Court decisions starting in 1962, God is being expelled from America. 1962, Engel v. Vital, The removal of prayer in public schools by the Supreme Court. 1963, Abington School District v. Shump, The removal of Bible reading in public schools by the Supreme Court. 1973, Roe v. Wade, legalized abortions by the Supreme Court. Although Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court on June 24, 2022, there have been over 60 million abortions in the United States. 2013, United States v. Windsor. The Supreme Court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act. DOMA stated that one man should be married to one woman. DOMA is biblically supported according to Genesis 2.24, which says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. 2015. Overfell v. Hodges, the Supreme Court case that ruled in favor of same-sex marriages. Contrary to the Lord's commands, America has made it illegal to teach about God and to pray to Him in public schools. America has made it legal to murder unborn children and has legalized homosexuality in the form of God's sacred institution, marriage. You may have heard the phrase, God's hand of protection. It seems that it is something God would do, keep a person or nation in the shelter of his hand. But what happens to a nation when it decides to disobey God's laws? In America's case, it's not that God has lifted his hand of protection. It's that America has left God's hand of protection. America claims to be a Christian nation with 70% of the people claiming such. But in reality, 
The true number of Christians are far less. This nation has made a God of their own liking. A God who accepts abortion. A God who accepts homosexuality. A God who accepts fornication. If you're having sex and you're not married, it's not called dating. It's called fornication. A God who accepts sexual immorality. This is not the true God of the Bible. This comes from the God of this world who has been given power for a short time, a.k.a. Satan. The God of the Bible tells us he hates hands that shed innocent blood. Proverbs 6.17 He calls homosexuality an abomination. Leviticus 18.22 He tells us sex is between a man and a woman in marriage. Genesis 2.24 Since America will not recognize God as the creator of all things, follow his commandments and give him the glory that only he deserves, he has left this nation to its own destruction. Proverbs 16.6 says, In mercy and truth atonement is provided for iniquity, and by the fear of the Lord one departs from evil. There is no fear of God in America, and the result is a society full of evil doers. When we are choosing to hold on to sin, rather than repent and change, God will not hear our prayers, as we read in Isaiah 1.15. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Proverbs 28.9 says, one who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer, is an abomination. America continues to do evil and disregard God's moral law, make up a God of our own liking, and continue to do what is right in our own eyes. America continues to lie, steal, blaspheme God's name, fornicate, commit adultery, look at pornography, covet what is not ours, and take human life. Jeremiah 30.12 says, For thus says the Lord, Your affliction is incurable, your wound is severe. As a nation, I think America may have reached the point in time where God will no longer hear our prayers because our sin is incurable. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. We're going to turn to Ukraine now, where there was an air alert spanning the entire country this morning as Russia stepped up attacks from above. In the capital city, these strikes are the worst since the start of the war, according to the mayor there. And Russia is escalating ahead of what has been a widely anticipated counteroffensive from Ukraine. Charlie Daggett has more now from inside the country. Tracer fire streaks across the skyline. Then... A direct hit, intercepting an incoming missile. Russia has gone on the attack ahead of Ukraine's counteroffensive. <laughs> Few believe the country would last a month against Russia. Now this army of underdogs is gearing up for a battle that could prove pivotal in the course of the war. Ukraine claiming that for the first time it shot down a Russian hypersonic missile, one of the most advanced the Kremlin has in its arsenal, with an American-supplied Patriot battery. New images capturing the battle for Ukraine unfolding in the skies over Kyiv. The country's Air Force tonight with a spectacular claim that for the first time they've shot down a Russian hypersonic missile, which Vladimir Putin once called invincible, with an American-made Patriot missile system. The Russian hypersonic, known as the Kinzel, can travel at more than five times the speed of sound and has a range of over a thousand miles. Ukraine only recently deploying the Patriot, the most technologically advanced and costly air defense system in the world. Each Patriot missile, almost three million dollars. But the Patriot's ability to shoot down a hypersonic missile has never been publicly demonstrated. And tonight, Russia claiming pro-Ukrainian forces continue to demonstrate their willingness to wage fights inside Russia. The Russian Ministry of Defense says pro-Putin rider Zakhar Prilipin was severely injured when a car he was traveling in exploded 250 miles east of Moscow. The driver was killed. Russian media alleging the suspect who was arrested is a native of Ukraine. Overseas and to Russia, tonight the Kremlin with a new warning that Russia and the U.S. are, quote, on the verge of an open armed conflict, blaming the U.S. for those drones over the Kremlin. The U.S., of course, calling it a blatant lie. 
Russia tonight hurling new threats aimed at the U.S. The deputy foreign minister warning they're, quote, on the verge of an open armed conflict with the United States. Again, claiming Ukraine carried out a drone attack on the Kremlin Wednesday, attempting to assassinate Russian President Vladimir Putin at the direction of the U.S. White House spokesman John Kirby firmly denying the allegations that the U.S. was involved as, quote, a blatant lie. Still, Russia warning of possible retaliation, saying it will respond when and wherever it sees fit. On the battlefield, nightmarish new video reportedly showing Russian incendiary bombs burning in a Ukrainian-held pocket of Bakhmut and a potentially major development on that battlefield today. Ibrahim Raisi today became the first Iranian president to visit Syria in 13 years and met in Damascus with President Bashar Assad. The meeting comes as some Arab countries have been warming up to Damascus and the Iranian neighborhood bully really wants to make sure that, I re that Tehran's domination of Syria remains clear to all. The two leaders signed a series of long-term cooperation agreements meant to send a message to the Arab world that Iran would remain Syria's leading economic trading partner. No Iranian president had visited Syria since 2010, even though Tehran has been a main backer of Assad's government since the 2011 uprising turned into civil war and played an instrumental role in turning the tide of the conflict in his favor. Iran sends military advisors and thousands of Iranian-backed fighters from around the Middle East to Syria to fight on Assad's side. Tehran has also been an economic lifeline for Assad, sending fuel and credit lines worth billions of dollars. Raisi's visit comes as some Arab countries, including Egypt and economic powerhouse Saudi Arabia, have been opening up to Assad, and their foreign ministers have visited Damascus in recent weeks. Iran's military presence in Syria has been a major concern for Israel, which has vowed to stop Iranian entrenchment along its northern border. Israel has reportedly carried out hundreds of strikes on targets in government-controlled parts of Syria in recent years. Since the beginning of 2023, Syrian officials have attributed a dozen strikes on Syrian territory to Israel, the latest on Tuesday that put the international airport of the northern city of Aleppo out of service. The Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Matthew 24, 6 and 7 And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars? See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Nation is the Greek word ethnos, which means a race, as of the same habit i.e. a tribe, especially a foreign, non-Jewish one, Gentiles, usually by implication, pagan. What I believe Jesus is saying here is that there have always been wars and rumors of wars. But when you see the same ethnic group fighting the same ethnic group, now pay attention. His return is near. This is the aftermath of fighting between rival ethnic groups in the district of Churachandpur. Dozens have been killed in the violence since Thursday and many others are injured. Tension between the majority Meitei and minority Kuki tribal communities has escalated since February. That's when the state government started a drive to evict some Kuki people from their houses, saying they had encroached on protected forests. Existing fault lines have been widened by the coup in neighbouring Myanmar. Thousands of refugees sharing ethnic ties with tribal groups in Manipur have crossed over and Meitei groups are accusing Kukis of sheltering illegal immigrants. The army has been deployed to calm the violence. A curfew and a shoot-to-kill order have been put in place. Luke 21:25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days, right before the return of Jesus Christ, is nations will be in a state of perplexity, or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today.
The torrential rains and flash flooding has left much of Rwanda in ruins, at least 130 people dead, in the fastest moving disaster the nation has seen. With water rising, officials say the death toll will also likely climb. The desperate search underway to rescue survivors. These floods and landslides particularly catastrophic as the relentless rain hit at night while many people were asleep. There are countless tales of tragedy, entire families lost, mass funerals now underway, devastated families mourning the loss of their young children. This mother describing her final moments with her son, saying, my son kept telling me to hold him tight so that we could not fall. We continued to hold each other as the house was falling apart. That's when the flood started increasing and he drowned. 5,000 homes completely destroyed with thousands more damaged, entire communities left homeless. This flood survivor saying, I have no money to rent a house, no husband, no children. I don't know where to go. The disaster was dangerous for us. Displaced residents returning to their destroyed homes to salvage the few belongings that weren't washed away. Flooding and rushing waters decimating the local infrastructure, destroying roads, bridges and multiple healthcare facilities. A heartbroken community banding together and bracing for more. This torrent has pounded Rwanda and more downpours are expected throughout the month. And although heavy rainfall is common between March and May, these ones have been particularly strong and long. Now, there are many factors that contribute to flooding, but a warming atmosphere caused by climate change is making extreme rainfall all the more likely. And scientists are warning that if we don't cut global emissions, the situation is only going to get worse. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real, and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. You had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. Days after the landslide, residents of Nyamukubi village are facing the full scale of that tragedy. Deborah Kalembe's worst fears have been confirmed. The river carried people away. My brother's wife died with all her four children. So far, hundreds of bodies have been recovered after landslides and floods in South Kivu. Villagers say they can't mourn until they find the bodies of their loved ones. 
A disaster has happened here. I lost my little brother who was director of a primary school. He drowned with his three teachers and I lost my grandfather. He also drowned and my sister-in-law. She's also dead and so far none of their bodies have been found. A busy community was buried in seconds. Local government says it will take longer to ramp up a rescue operation. The region is plagued with armed groups and displacement crises, which hamper efforts to fight emergencies. This woman is one of hundreds of people who have come to Nyamukubi to get medical help. But after days of floods and landslides devastated the South Kivu region, the village hospital has run out of medicine. Chance Kinzo has a broken leg. She says she was buried and rescued only after her screams for help were heard. I clung to a collapsing house. It fell on top of me and I was covered in dirt. I lost lots of members of my family, brothers and sisters-in-law. Two bodies have been found, but so far the others have not. Since Thursday, flooding and landslides have swept away roads and left hundreds dead. President Felix Chisekedi declared Monday as a day of national mourning. Nyamukubi's village chief says people are doing what they can to recover, but they need help. We ask the national government to come to our aid urgently and everyone who is watching me in this interview across the world to come in an emergency because there are no places to sleep, there are no blankets to cover, there is nothing to eat. Dozens of people have been buried, some in mass graves. But with nearly 2,000 people reported missing, many more graves will most likely need to be dug. Their homes completely destroyed by flooding, thousands of Rwandans are seeking shelter wherever they can. Unlike more than 100 others, they escaped with their lives, but little else remains. The heavy rains started Tuesday evening in the country's western and northern provinces. Then came the floods and landslides. Rivers of mud swept away homes, bridges and roads, cutting off access to several areas. The government is rushing emergency supplies to the worst hit areas and says it will extend financial support to families who lost loved ones. But residents are fearful because rivers are still raging, risking more mudslides and flooding. Experts say extreme weather events are happening more often and with more intensity due to climate change. There are two key prophecies concerning Jesus' signs of his coming and the end of the age that are crucial to discerning that we are living in the last days. The first prophecy is found in Matthew 24, 8. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. This is how end time signs such as wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes will occur. They will become more frequent and more intense as we get closer to Jesus' return. The second prophecy is in Luke 21, 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Notice Jesus said when these things begin to happen. Jesus was saying that when you see a convergence of Bible prophecy, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. We are witnessing not only the convergence of Bible prophecy around the world, we are experiencing the frequency and intensity of these prophetic events as well. Here in Alberta, residents continue to flee their homes in search of safety, as wildfires continue to rage across the western Canadian province. Hot and dry weather conditions have led to rapidly spreading fires. One third of the blazes were listed as out of control. It's not very surprising. Um, it's very dry out there and it's been very dry for a number of years. Uh, where do I go from here? Well, I guess we just wait and see when we can go back home and go back home and see if we have anything to go back to. So The province has been ablaze for the past five days. So far, more than 29,000 people have been forced to leave their homes and thousands more have been told they may need to leave at any moment. According to emergency management officials, scattered showers, particularly in the south, have somewhat improved the situation but officials warned that the relief only concerned certain areas. At the moment, there are 108 wildfires burning in Alberta. 31 of those are out of control. And in the last 24 hours, we noted 16 new wildfire starts. The total area of the province burned this year has now passed 375,000 hectares. 
On Saturday, a province-wide state of emergency was declared. Despite the deployment of exceptional means, officials say they expect strong winds to cause the fires to grow bigger over the next few days. Food, we all need it, we can't live without it, and when it grows scarce, our shared future is threatened. Economic crises, epidemics, conflicts and extreme weather events can wreak havoc on global food systems, in particular when many of those shocks come at the same time. 2022 was a year of unprecedented challenges for the global food system. So is this year going to be any better? The FAO, together with other international organisations, has warned that concern remains high for developing countries which are still facing double-digit food inflation, aggravated by the depreciation of their local currencies against the US dollar and their mounting debt burden. And that's leading to rising food insecurity and undernourishment. Well, this year is yet another one of extreme jeopardy for those struggling to feed their families, with more than 900,000 people around the world fighting to survive in famine-like conditions. This is 10 times more than five years ago, and that's an alarmingly rapid increase. The scale of the current global hunger and malnutrition crisis is growing bigger and bigger, with 345 million people projected to be food insecure in 2023 alone. And that's more than double the number of 2020. A staggering rise of 200 million people compared to pre-COVID-19 pandemic levels. But why is the world hungrier than ever? The United Nations World Food Programme says that a deadly combination of factors lies behind it. Conflict. It is still the biggest driver of hunger, with 70% of the world's hungry living in areas afflicted by war and violence. Conflicts in Ukraine and Sudan are further proof of how conflict feeds hunger. The climate crisis is another one of the leading causes of the steep rise in global hunger. Climate shocks destroy lives, crops and livelihoods and undermine people's ability to feed themselves. Global fertilizer prices have climbed even faster than food prices, threatening to turn food affordability into a food availability crisis with the production of maize, rice, soybean and wheat all falling in 2022. International aid agencies' operating costs are also at an all-time high. The World Food Programme's monthly operating costs are $73 million, above their 2019 average, a staggering 44% rise. The extra now spent on operating costs would have previously fed 4 million people for a month. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. We are fast approaching a time known as the tribulation that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat, as we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is 
Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.